I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands. One nation. Under God. Indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty, justice for all. And to the republic for which it stands, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, pledge of indivisible to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, pledge of indivisible to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, pledge of indivisible to the flag of the United States of America. With liberty and justice for all. With liberty and justice for all. With liberty and justice for all. church again, isn't it? Come on, everybody. Woo! Come on, let's celebrate. Come on, one more time. Let's go. It's good. It's good. It's good to be in church again. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, so if you don't know me yet, uh, my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves because you're amazing. Go, go, go. Before we continue, I'd still like to say hello to our online audience. I know so many of you are joining us online, and I'm so thankful for the technology that allows us to do that. And so I want to let you know that you are not, um, you, I'm so glad that you're able to experience this service today, and we've got plenty for you. We've worked tirelessly to make sure this is going to be everything that it can be just for you. Come on, everybody. Can we give it up for our online audience? They're cheering for you. They're cheering for you. It's wonderful. So um, we're going to start a new series today called With Liberty and Justice for All. Are you familiar with that phrase? I bet many of you grew up. I pledge allegiance to the flag, United States of America. Okay, okay, we got it, we got it, we got it. You, you know it. You know it. This is going to feel like your sixth grade classroom if I keep this going. But the part I really like about that in the context of the season that we're seeing right now, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible, I love that, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Come on, somebody, that's a good place to say amen. <laughs> liberty and justice for all. We as the church should be leading the way with the travesties we've seen in our nation, with the division that we're seeing in our nation, with people pitted against people, people that should be loving one another, are coming against one another. Our, our culture has turned to divisiveness, dissension, fighting, bickering, word over word, and, and, and it's just not right. So Tiffany and I, we, we wanna lead the way we want to lead the way and, and help our church understand. We want to help you understand what it means to be one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, this is, very, this is a very biblical thing. I don't have it on the screens for you, but the, the scripture that inspired this series is Proverbs 31, verses 8 through 9. It says this, speak up. For those who cannot speak for themselves, ensure justice for those being crushed. <laughs> it's really specific. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. 
See, here at this church, we're going to make the first move to build bridges. We're going to make the first move to bring people back together again. And we're going to make the first move to be a lifeline, which means to bring justice to a hurting people. If we see poor, we're going to help. If we see oppressed, we're going to help. If we see anything like that, we're going to be a lifeline. It's in our name. It's who we are. And it's who we always intended to be. So let's teach about that. Let's talk about this. The, the, the name of the message today is called Colorblind. Colorblind. Because uh, I grew up colorblind. I don't know if any of you knew that. I grew up literally colorblind. Well, not literally because it was just in my fashion sense. I've been wearing some purple shorts, a green shirt, and black kicks like the solid black. Not cool black, like solid black. Solid black. Color blind. And when I realized that my fashion sense was a little bit off, I, I, I leaned into this monochromatic look. <laughs> I haven't gotten over it. You know, I'm still, I'm still there. Actually, funny story is I was probably in fourth grade and my mom was involved in all this. So mom, if you're watching, you can shake your head with me. And I was, I was going, I was, I was venturing into my, my sense of style, I was, I was like colorblind. I didn't know, so one color is all I had. And so I had these white shoes and white pants and a white turtleneck with a, with a brown t-shirt over the top. Come on, who remembers wearing a turtleneck with, with a shirt on top of it? Man, you didn't have no style either. It's okay, it's okay. I didn't really, and I remember walking to school and my mom helped me, you know, she loves me and it was a sad day for us Joneses because we got, we got humiliated that day. Because when you're in fourth grade, walking into school, looking that sharp, looking that sharp, man, you're gonna get some attention. I walked in, I got some attention straight up and my friends were not giving me the good kind of attention. They're like, nice outfit, guy. And these fourth graders were good with their little slices on me, you know. I, colorblind. This monochromatic thing, you know, is like, just, God, I got made fun of for that. It was my tendency. Just one color made things simple for me. Just one color made things simple for me because I don't have to. And that's one of the saddest things about, about uh, doing church online. Nobody could see my feet. Can you see these shoes? They are so white. I've been waiting to show you for like three months. I bought them right before quarantine started. Look at these shoes. Look at them. You see that online? Come on, they're good. You can only see me from here up, but I'm doing stuff down here, okay? I'm doing stuff. I'm not just wearing moccasins down there. One of my buddies, he's a pastor in the Bay Area, and I, see, I saw him preaching in Ugg boots. I'm like, bro, you can't do that. You can't, that's going to leak out. People are going to find out about that. But you know me, I was, I was always one, just one color made it simple for me. See, I, I grew up colorblind in another way, too. Uh, because it was uncomfortable for me to acknowledge cultural differences as a young, as a young man, as a young man. See, I, I grew up in Yuba City, which is up north about 100 miles or so. And in Yuba City, there is a one of, at the time, it was one of seven Sikh temples in the nation. And every year, there was a Sikh parade on my street. So I lived on Terra Buena Road. And the Sikh temple is on Terra Buena Road. And it would bring in about 60,000 East Indians to have a party on my street every year. And I was used to that. Like, what I did not, if, if you follow me on social media, maybe you've seen the, my, my Instagram or my Facebook where I, I did a little tiny study about this. So this might be old news for some of you, but not for others. That I, I didn't want to see the differences in people. I didn't, it was easier for me, and maybe you've heard this too, is, oh, you and me were no different. We're no different. Listen to that. No different. Just the same. Okay? Well, I grew up in Yuba City, lots of, lot, a huge East Indian population, and I had East Indian friends. My friend Harmon, by the way, I went over to his house, like, as a kid growing up. We liked all the same video games, and I went over there, and there was differences. His house was different than mine. The, there, were the, there was different food. There was more people in the house, you know. My little white nuclear family, like, there was nobody over there ever. It was just mom, dad brother, sister, the four of us, you know, just that normal thing. But his house, there was always family there. Oh, you and me, were just the same. Well, I get what you mean. I'm going to get there, but I, I, didn't, I didn't recognize or I just didn't, I didn't have the tools. 
I didn't have the tools to address differences and celebrate them. That's what we're going to talk about today. Breaking out of being colorblind. And, and some of you, this might be very new information. Very new. Where you're, you're right now your defense. Talking about racism. Talking about the issue that we're seeing in our nation above all right now. Even above, I believe, the pandemic. Is this issue right here. Because this pandemic is going to pass. But this thing we've been dealing with for a very, very very long time and here it comes again here it comes again and which shows us we, we need to address this and it needs to start right here it needs to start with us it needs to start with the church if the church isn't leading the way in bringing justice if the church isn't leading the way in showing love and leading the way with diversity i heard that 10 a.m on a sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the whole week I heard that. I, I can't speak to that. I haven't been to every church, but I, I, I'm sad that, it even, that anybody's ever said it about us. So is this wrong to think that we are different and it's okay? Is that wrong? Can, can people still say that it's good to say that? If not, how do we stop it? So I want to share this point with you. If you're taking notes, you can join us on the YouVersion Bible app. Because we've got all the notes on there, and you can follow the scriptures, and you can even take notes later. You version Bible app, and the first point is this. Stop ignoring our differences. Let's stop ignoring our differences. Because the truth is that no person in this room or watching online is truly the same as another. We are all different. I don't care if we have the same shade on our skin. We're all different. And we're designed that way. Listen to this. Listen to this scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Paul said the human body has many parts. Many parts. But the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, not what you think, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. What you need to know about this scripture is that when it's speaking about slavery here, he's not talking about the slavery that has been created in our cultures. This has nothing to do with race. This has more to do with occupation than it does race. So not for a second, all right? Not for a second. That is not what it is. But here's some truth for you. To ignore is ignorance. Don't the words even sound similar? <laughs> That's because there's a root word going on there. Ignorance, the root word, that ignore. To ignore. Oh, we're the same. You and me, we're exactly the same. To ignore is ignorance. And we don't want to be ignorant about people that we're trying to love. If I don't know anything about the person I'm trying to love, how am I supposed to love them well if I refuse to see differences? Ignoring leads to ignorance as well. And if I'm ignorant with you, I can't love you. So we cannot do this. Paul is saying, you are all made with different gifts, different abilities, different strengths, different looks, and this is good. This is how I intend to move you forward as the church to make a difference in this world. Because you're, you're different from each other. Can you imagine a foot saying to the hand, we're the same, brother? We're the same. There's no difference here. One's a foot and one's a hand. And that has nothing to do with race. We need to start appreciating differences in the body of Christ. We need to start celebrating differences in the body of Christ. And some of you might even be thinking, why are we even starting here? Like, isn't this, can't you be more direct? I think this very thing is a root reason why racism still persists today is because our defense is to ignore. I don't want to see that there's a difference or that there's a problem, and because I don't see it, I can never address it. So what I'm, st I'm starting very strategically with us today, that we would open our eyes to the differences that we have with one another, and we would begin to celebrate them. Celebrate them. Amen, everybody? Amen. Amen. Come on. We can't ignore people. That's no way to love people. 
Ignoring people is not a way to love people. To ignore the differences in others is to act ignorantly. I actually watch, <laughs> who's been on YouTube lately? Don't raise your hand. It's like criminal these days to be on Facebook Watch or YouTube, man. The videos out there are insane. There's got to be a censor for this stuff, man. I, but I wanted to coach myself up, so I'm on YouTube, I'm on Facebook, and I'm scrolling a little bit. I'm watching these videos being put forth, and I, I made it a point to watch videos from one side of an issue, and I made points to watch videos from another side of the issue, and I'm like, man, this is not good. I watched a video of somebody behind a table. It was like a table, you know, just a regular, a regular folding table, and he's sitting behind it, and he, he's a white man. And there's a black man over there, and he, they were yelling at each other. I don't know what about. You know, these videos are made to just stir things up, seems like. But the white man was yelling at the black man, we're no different. We're no different, you and I. We're no different. We're no different. And they were fighting about how the fact that if they were different or not. I was disgusted. I was like, this is the, this is the exact thing I'm talking about this Sunday. And here it is right here. I saw another thing, like even before, after I got done with my message, I didn't even have time to plug it in. But I saw it, it was like a picture of Morgan Freeman and then somebody typing next to him. I don't know if Morgan Freeman really said this, by the way, because right now I don't trust hardly anything I'm seeing out there. But it was a picture of Morgan Freeman and he had the, the little statement next to him. And I'm going to say he said it, but I really don't know if he did. Um, you want to end racism, well, well um, stop talking about it. I was like, hold up, R Really? Are you sure? Stop calling me black man and I'll stop calling you white man. Now, I don't know if he said that, but I mean, even if he did, it's like, it's like, okay, he did, but like, you know, are we getting this stuff from like, well, he's an actor, so he knows. He was in the Shawshank Redemption. He must know. He must know this, but I'm thinking, but this is not, there's no malice behind that, but there's a, it's that same thing that I had. Just don't talk about it and it'll go away. Just ignore it and it'll go away. Like, like it wouldn't be insulting to say, I don't see green eyes on you. I don't see blue eyes on you. I don't see black hair on you. I don't see your skin. I, I don't see anything. But there's, there's an innocence behind that. There's an innocence behind that that says on the inside, in the eyes of God, we are all the same. Now, that is very true. Don't hear me say that, that we are inherently different in the eyes of God. We are absolutely not. In the eyes of God, we are the same. And that is true, but God made us to be different from one another. And I don't believe that was ever intended to be ignored or, or brushed under the rug. I, I think that is a knee-jerk response to a hard issue. And when I was a kid and didn't want to deal with it, that's, how, that's exactly what I did. And I see adults doing the very same thing. But I'm, I'm going to say this, so we can't leave this part out. We are the same in our need for Jesus. Now we're all the same, as the saying goes. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. All of us need Jesus the same, and all of us, in the eyes of God, our, our blood is all the same color. The way that we're put together, God, God made us the same way, but our differences, our gifts, even our, even our looks, the, our culture, the culture that we come from. My, we're, we're all called to be in God's culture, in God's kingdom. So if anything, we should all be just forsaking all of those things to come under one banner of Christianity. I'm a follower of Christ first. Father, second. Husband, second. American, fourth. You know, like, I love all those things. But first and foremost, I'm a follower of Christ. My identity comes from that. We are all the same in our need for Jesus. That we do share. Other than that, every single one of us has differences that make us unique and beautiful. Unique and beautiful. Otherwise, how would we ever get anything done? What would a body with all hands look like? Ugly. <laughs> Ugly, you know, it wouldn't look good. It'd be, it'd be grasping around all the time. <laughs> I was talking to my wife about this. I was talking to Tiffany about, um, about how I used to really act that way and be like, oh no, nothing's different to the point of it's not even real. Racism isn't real. Nothing's re none of that's real. We're all the same. Blah, blah, blah. I was talking to Tiffany as if she f stumbled into that too. And she looked at me with disgust like, ew, you used to think that? You used to think that? But, but Tiffany, even though she's whiter than me, 
like by a lot. She's way more cultured than I am. Way more cultured. Is Tiffany in there? She is. I love you. I didn't see you. I was like doing the story, like, you know, not to hurt, not to hurt anybody's feeling, but she's way more cultured than me. Okay, as a 19-year-old white blonde girl went over to Morocco to minister to Muslims and she didn't get killed. So she's got the cultural differences thing down pat. Like she knows that, and I just learned later, man, we need to, we need to acknowledge people's differences because you cannot go to a culture like that in like that kind of hot spot and just be like, oh, there's no differences here and survive. You can't go there and be like, oh, well, you know, it's all the same. I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna do a church with lights and haze and it'll, it'll, it'll work over there. No. It will not work, and it will get, well, who knows, but, but Tiffany understood that, and that's when I started to realize, man, this is, this is something I need to deal with. This is something that I need to deal with in my own heart. I want, I'm asking you, stop saying that you're the same as anybody else, because you're not. You're unique. You're beautiful. Every difference about you, every difference about you is beautiful. Every difference about you is something God put on you. He knit you together in your mother's womb, with your hair color, your eye color, the way you are, and that's beautiful, and God loves you exactly that way you are. So who am I to say that that is to be ignored about a person? And I think subtly this is an issue that we face in the body of Christ, and I hope after today it, it opens our eyes and opens our heart to say, no, differences are good, celebrate it, and we actually need to strive for this, which brings me to my next point. We need to start celebrating diversity. We need to start celebrating diversity. Now, stopping ignoring differences is one thing, but celebrating diversity is completely another because this takes work. This takes grind. This takes discomfort. It's, it's uncomfortable to go to someone's house, like my friend Harmon, going over to his house and not understanding anything or the way they were talking or the food they were eating and the smell and everything that was different about it, that was uncomfortable. That's why I'm saying we, we need to push and strive to celebrate diversity and bring that into the church. Bring diversity into the church. I've, I know churches don't all feel this way, which is sad, which breaks my heart. I know churches don't all feel this way. They would never say it, but in the way they move forward, like I don't usually talk about any other churches ever, but I've seen it. I've heard them talk about it or not talk about something that needs to be talked about. And, and all around, all you see is one type of person doing every function, and it's, and I understand, it takes work. It's not easy. You have to go out on a limb to do it. Listen to this, different cultures, colors, foods, tradition, clothes, languages, people. I mean, this sounds like a party, doesn't it? And it will be. Listen to Revelation 7, starting in verse 9. John's, John wrote this, seeing the end times. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation, every tribe, people, and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. Get that picture in your mind. From every nation, every tongue, every skin color, every dialect, every everything. They're all standing before Jesus. Man, they're all up there in heaven ready to celebrate. This is what it will look like. Why don't we just get there quicker? <laughs> Let's at least try. I didn't even finish. Standing in front of the throne before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne from the Lamb. Diversity will stand the test of time. The only reason John wrote that they were all different is because he saw that they were all different. Diversity will stand the test of time in heaven. One thing my pastor always used to say, heaven is going to be very diverse. There's going to be every he was very good about this. I think my pastor, Pastor Ken, if you're watching, I love you, Pastor. Your heritage here is, uh, we love you. We love you so much for, for bringing that in. And he would, he would go above and beyond to, to bring people, all different kinds of people, into the leadership table. I love him for that. And, 
And I love that that's our heritage here at this church, Haven. Diversity will stand the test of time. The Bible is very clear about that. Diversity will win. So let's get on the winning side. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Let's get on the winning side. The more diverse our congregation, the better. I'm saying it. I'm saying it. The more diverse our congregation, the better. Amen? Amen? Yeah, it's true. It's better to be more diverse. I'll get to that in a second. I'll show you how. But let me tell you this. Better isn't always easier. Better is not always easier. In fact, better is often harder. <laughs> Anything in life is this way, isn't it? Anything that's better takes, takes usually more effort to get to. We think the path of least resistance is the way to get there. It's not. Diver, di it's not. It's not easier. Better isn't always easier. Heaven will be diverse, and we might as well start enjoying it now. God loves variety, and he's called people from every tongue and every nation. Tiff and I have been saying this for years. Better is not, better is not easier because Tiff and I lead side by side, you know. She preaches, I preach. She leads staff meetings, I lead them. She leads rallies, I lead them. She leads staff, I lead them. It's, we lead side by side. So we learned early on that <laughs> it's better, but it's not easier. <laughs> it is not easier at all. Of course, because I'm better when Tiffany leads right beside me. She makes me better. And Tiffany, well, she's just better. Well, what can I say about that? She's just better overall. She's just better. But it's harder. Why? Because we don't always agree. <laughs> we don't always agree. And everybody's looking at me like, what do you mean? I'm saying, we, we never fight. Tiffany and I never, never fight. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes we do. Maybe once in a while we fight. But let me tell you about one doozy that we had early on in our ministry career. We, we, it was our very first series, I think. Tiffany, you remember this? Our very first series that we wanted to start. We were picking a book. She's nodding at me like, don't. Don't. <laughs> don't talk about this. I have to. Tiffany wanted to do it out of the book of Acts. She said, our church is ready. We're going to do the book of Acts, and we're going to teach people how to minister to people, and we're going to multiply in book of Acts, and we're ready to go. And I'm, I'm in Bible college at the time, and I'm like, well, well, hang on a second, because Luke wrote Acts, and so we ought to start from Luke's beginning narrative out of the Gospel of Luke. And she said, but I want to do Acts. <laughs> and I said, well, I think we should do Luke. And she said, I think we should do Acts. Luke, Acts, Luke, Acts. I remember where I was sitting on the end of the bed, remember, in our little, like, 25-foot, square-foot apartment. <laughs> so, like, it was this big. And I was sitting on the edge of our bed, and you were sitting at the vanity, uh, there was a dresser there in the mirror, and you, were, and you were fixing your hair in the mirror. I remember this. This was like eight years ago. And she's fixing her hair in the mirror, and she's like, I think we'd do Acts. And I'm sitting on the edge of the bed looking at her through the mirror. You know, it's like a reflection. I'm like, well, I think Luke. And like, you know how if you, if you like shine a laser in the mirror, it'll, the laser went pew, pew. I was like, oh, we did both. We did both. <laughs> we did both, man. We was a compromise. You know, but I learned later in my marriage how to deal with that better. <laughs> but we did both. But we're better because we have such a different perspective. Tiffany is so, so sensitive to the Spirit of God. Man, you, she could come up here right now and, and just begin to sense what people are feeling because the Spirit of God is telling her. And she can, and she can share that, and it's powerful. And, and people see it all the time. They notice it. And I'm sure I have some strengths, but they're definitely different. <laughs> they're different. You know, they're more like mathematician style, science and bullet points and, you know, boring stuff, very boring stuff. But we're better together. We're better together. But that doesn't make it easy. Diversity is better, but it's not easier, but it's better. Business people, let me talk to you for a minute. If you're watching online, you own your own business or you're a manager. Let me just tell you, diversity is better. It's advantageous for you to just bring diversity in for its own sake, for the perspective. Watch this. How foolish would it be 
to make a huge investment in the business world without doing the proper market research. And what is market research except finding out the habits, the trends, and the patterns of the people in your market? No successful business person would ever say, well, this is the way I like it, so let's just do it that way. Nobody who stays in business talks that way. You just don't. You just, you never would. No, you, you covet broad perspective as a business person. So your business doesn't go belly up. Better is not easier. It's uncomfortable. It's outside of your comfort zone. It feels unnatural. And I'm talking to me because this is a burdensome idea for me because I've always been into like the, you heard of the Enneagram, the personality profiles, strengths, finders, all that stuff. Anybody recognize those kinds of things? I know you all do. It's fine. I'm into that stuff. I like it a lot. And everything about my personality is Lone Ranger. Lone Ranger. I'm out front and I'm just like running and is there anybody behind me? I can't remember. I don't know. I can't stop long enough to see if you're still there. I hope you can run fast because we are going places. Everything I'm talking about today is counter to that. That means people like me, if you're like me, if you're a go-getter, type A, all that stuff, you've got to wait long enough if your goal is to reach people. If your goal is to be successful, you better wait long enough to bring people into your car so they can drive with you. So they can say, you're about to miss your exit. <laughs> it's an analogy. But this needs to happen in the church. This needs to happen in the church. I mean with the individuals. You, you are the church. I'm the church. You're the church. You're the church. Everybody watching, if you're, if you're a follower of Christ, this is for us to do. We need to broaden. And so let me just, I, I know I pretty much explained it, but let me make it very, very clear. Diversity is better, not easier. Diversity is better. I will stand with that statement. Diversity is better, but it's not easier because to do it right takes work and you have to slow down a little bit and you have to unlearn a few things. This to me is is a root cause of the issues that we're seeing in our nation. It's because we're not pushing for diversity. We're not striving for diversity. We're not looking for ways. One of my favorite mentors and pastors, uh, he, he pastors in the Bay Area, uh, big old, big old honking church over there, and they've been doing it for 20 years, and they just grew, 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 and they've done really, really well. And I, when we go there to visit, you know, their platform is like salt and pepper. Not like the group salt and pepper. <laughs> that was so stupid. <laughs> it's like, it's black, it's white, his, it's Hispanic, it's Filipino. Their platform, their worship team, it's like you, there is no person like the other standing next to each other. And I asked him about that. Well, I didn't even have to ask him about that. He brings it up on his own. I ha I... He says, I have to make that happen because people naturally gravitate to other people like them. We, na we naturally do this because it's, it's easier. It's easier just to make friends and to have my best friends and everybody I'm always hanging out with are people pretty much just like me. It's just, it's not, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it's, it's natural to do this. So my pastor friend, in a meeting where I'm talking with him, a graphic designer come in and show him, you know, hey, pastor, here's one of the graphics. I want to show you this graphic right here. Uh, then we're going to hang up these banners in the, the, the entryway. And he says to the graphic designer, he says, what do I not like about that graphic? It's like a graphic of people laughing and hugging and stuff. He says, what do I not like about that? And the graphic designer like, you know, I don't know. Like, what do you? He said, think hard. What, what do I not like about that? And the graphic designer said, oh, they're, they're all the same color. Right. Fix it. Fix it. It's work. It's work to put out there and let people know and celebrate, truly invite people who are different than us to the table. I hope this is a landmark message for us. I really do. I hope that this is a stake in the ground that we can move forward from and say, you know what, we're going to try. So I'm not blind to 
what I'm looking at. You know, I'm not blind to what city we live in, the culture we come from, what Lada has been since its creation. This is going to take work, everybody. And it's, it's not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not bashing anybody. I'm not a mad person. The person I am is like, okay, what do we need to do? Okay, what do, what, what do we need to do? Where should we go? How should we get there? You know, there's no sense in, you know, I'm, I'm a forgiven man, all right? I'm not dwelling in my sins from the past. I'm just thinking, how can I move forward correctly? That's all I'm thinking about. Church, let's move forward correctly. Let's, mo- let's watch our steps. Let's move forward. And, and it starts in here, everybody, with all of us, with all of us. This is a call to action for every single one of us. Diversity is better, but it's not easier. So last week, um, I had the privilege of, of doing some golfing. You know, I, uh, I got to actually do some. That's why I have any kind of color on my face at all. That's why I have any kind of tan. I don't know if these lights let you know, but I've been in the sun a little bit. And I got to golf a couple days last week, and I had the privilege, like right when everything was happening, you know, the, the heat was on, the, the media was going crazy, white people, black people, the racism conversation is full blast. And I had the privilege of, of golfing with two black pastors one day after the other. The first day, a 70-year-old pastor in Stockton, a black man, and he plays good golf too, man. I hope I can swing like that when I'm his age. That's all I'm trying to say. And then the very next day, another black pastor from Stockton, and I got to golf with both of them back to back. And so I'm, I'm going, I'm thinking in my head, how can I, I need to get some information right now <laughs> because I, I, I need to know how I, so I asked this question to both pastors. I asked this question to both pastors. I said, Okay, I'm a white pastor myself from a primarily white town, and I'm a, I'm a young white male. How, and I just asked them, I just wanted to see what they'd say. How would you have me talk about this situation that we're facing right now? And both of them said nothing about racism. I was shocked. I really was. You know what? And this is what the first one, this is what the first one said. The older man, the 70 year old pastor from Stockton who lived in the South. I grew up in California. I only visited the South last week, or not last week, (laughs) last year. You're like, man, you get around. (laughs) Last year I got to go to Tennessee, visit my family there, and it is lovely. But I didn't see everything, so I I know that there is more going on there than just what's happening in California. And so this man has seen it all. And you know what he said to me? Uh, He'd been pastoring 40 years probably. He said, teach people about sin. From a black pastor in Stockton. He didn't say, you know, you need to teach people to stop being racist. He said, teach people that Cain killed Abel, and that is in our heritage. And that is some hate for our brother we're born with. And you need to show people, help people understand that this is not a race issue. This is a sin issue. And if we're going to beat this thing, if we're going to make good progress, and now is the time. And we need to understand that this is in our nature. He said, teach him about Cain and Abel. And so in honor of him, I want to turn your attention to Genesis chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help I produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother, named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel was a shepherd, and Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops with a gift, for a gift, as a gift for the Lord. Verse 4, Abel also brought a gift. Notice this, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked die 
dejected, sad, miserable. Now, I usually only talk about this when I'm talking about giving because it says outright that Abel brought the first and the best and Cain was like, I don't know, like whatever I got right here. God will always honor the best and the first. So be careful how you bring your offering, by the way. But verse 6 goes on to say this. God saying to Cain, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what's right. But if you refuse to do what's right, watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Very next verse. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out to the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Just killed him. They have the same parents. I bet they were the same color. People killing each other. People hurting each other. It's, it's in all of us. And to think that you and I are above it or past it, Yes, we've been made new. If you've, if you've accepted Jesus as Lord, God can set you free from any kind of sin. But you need to know, you need to know, from my mother's womb, I was a sinner. And I need to do what God said to do. And what did he say to do? He said, you must subdue that sin and, and display mastery over it. Cain looked at his brother and thought, well, it'd be better if you just weren't here. That, my friends, is the heart of the issue. That's the heart of the issue. It's that we have sin that is unrepentant. Church, it's time for us to repent right here, right now. It's the time. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes together, in fact. Come on, let's do this. Father, we just repent right now. We repent for our lack of understanding. We repent we repent from our sin, from our wicked ways. Lord, we ask that you would give us a heart of flesh. Replace that heart of stone, Lord, and soften our hearts. Open our eyes, open our ears, that when we see injustice, we would have your heart in us. That when we see oppression, that we would see love for our neighbor instead love for our neighbor. Lord, we repent right here and right now. If any of us have felt that way, have ignored the people around them, Lord, we repent from that. Lord, and we will start to look at people the way you look at them. Beautiful in every way. Just, just like that. We will see people your way. God, and we, we repent. I repent, Lord, in front of everybody. I repent for being ignorant. I repent for ignoring. I repent for my hard heart and not wanting to face things that justice calls me to deal with. With heads down and eyes closed, I, I just want to give an invitation for every single one of us that if, we, if, you're, if you know you're not where you should be with God right now, this is your opportunity. Everybody listening online, everybody in the house today, that if you're not where you should be with God, maybe you used to walk with Him, but you're not where you know you should be. This is your opportunity right here and right now to, to come back to Him. Or maybe you've never been walking with the Lord and walking with, with Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Well, now is your time. And if anybody's ready for that kind of prayer today, I want you to just type amen in the comments or with heads down and eyes closed right here to just lift your hand subtly. I can see you to say, yes, I see you. Yes, Lord, you're my Savior. I want to make you my Savior today. Hallelujah. Come on, can everybody in the whole house and everybody even listening online, can we pray this prayer together? Just say this, Father God, I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. I repent for my sin. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross 
to pay the penalty for my sins and my mistakes and my shortcomings. I give you my whole life. Fill me with your spirit. Make me new and direct my path. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate everyone who made that decision today? Everyone online, everyone in the house. God bless you. We see you. Amen. And I'm so grateful, so grateful that we get to be in church again, seeing your face. Ah, I can preach different. Oh, I'm like, I see you. I feel you. I hear you. Man, it's so good. I want to like run across the stage and run back and forth. I'm like, yeah. You know, I've had to preach like this for like three months. With my feet glued to the floor, I can't stand it. Online, I love you. I do, I truly love you, but I cannot stand it anymore. I have to get moving. So I wanna let you know about a couple things before we go. There is, we're not passing any baskets or anything like that. So I just wanna let you know that there's a few different ways to give and they're up on the screen. You can text any amount to 84321. If the service blessed you, and you want to see us continue to move forward and be a lifeline in the community, go ahead and text any amount to that number, 84321. There's a giving box by the exit. And so there's a little bit of differences here now. So pay attention just real quick because no baskets, no nothing. So there's some things in the seat back in front of you that you can take out, put in, and just drop them in, you know, and then sanitize. Right after that, you do that. All right, can you go back to that one? I'm going to talk about all four. Okay, and then there's lifelineloda.com for those of you online. And then most of you in-house still like to do it that way. Bless your heart. Facebook donate button, the 100% best way to give, no fees. It's just crazy. Even checks cost money. It is absolutely free to do it on Facebook. I don't know how they did it. Some kind of witchcraft. I'm not sure if we should do it after all. But it's crazy. I'm just saying that's the way to go. Connection. If you would love to connect with us online, there... <laughs> I'm more sassy when there's people in the room. I don't know what it is. I, <laughs> I'm sassy when people are here. There's a connection card in the seat back in front of you. You've got to like plank to get to it. It's pretty far in front of you, but you can get that, fill it out. Those are sanitized and we'll replace them with new connection cards later and you can drop them in the box. And everybody listening online, there's a, there's a link in the description that you can fill out. Next slide is growth track. We're having growth track. Oh, Growth Track is the way that you can get plugged in here at the church. And we've got a couple different great ways to do it. Directly, 10 minutes after service today, anybody who's not on the team yet can sit in that room, the Growth Track room, straight in the back, and join the team, learn more about what it means to be a member of Lifeline. You can also do it via Zoom. Sign up online at lifelinelodi.com. Come on, can we all stand to our feet today? I'm going to pray over you, and then we're going to get going. Thanks, sound man. You're amazing, too. He's sending me messages on that screen back there. I love you, brother. You're amazing. Can we give it up for our production team? Have you seen what they've been doing around here? Oh, my gosh. People have been working like crazy. Thank you guys so much. Being here until, like, late at night, it's just crazy. Thank you so much. Let me pray a blessing over you, and then we'll go. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray blessing over every single person listening right now, everybody here, everybody online. I pray blessing over their finances, Lord, as we put you first in our finances. I pray that our finances will be blessed. Lord, that we would be the lender, not the borrower, as we put you first in that area. I pray for raises, promotions, people who are out of work and hurting for money. So thankful that we as a church can move forward and give. And Lord, I pray that blessing would trickle down to every single person listening to me right now. I pray over every relationship, people who are feeling lonely, isolated, people who are feeling just totally cut off. Lord, I pray that relationship will begin to be rebuilt right now in the name of Jesus. That community would, would stand through this test of time for three months. We haven't seen each other, but Lord, that relationships would come back just the way they were and even better than before. And I pray for every single person's health in this time, in this pandemic. Lord, I pray covering and protection and healing over every person in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody. Say amen with me. Amen. Let's celebrate. Praise God. Amen.